Okay, before we get started, I also wanted to mention, and actually I made a post about this, um, I don't know, I, I suppose it was maybe late last week, but I brought a couple of leaves up here, and I think one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this, so um, I'm just going to kind of show you here and just talk a little bit about it. So uh, this, this is actually the same plant that I made a post about, uh, like I said, about a week ago or so, about um, insect damage on plants. So this is a, a leaf that I pulled off of a Joe pie weed. And it happens to be in our uh, pollinator garden here at Wasco Nursery. In fact, we have a, what we call, uh, what I like to call a micro prairie right outside the back door in a terrible location uh, in a raised kind of planting bed that was created many years ago. It's uh, 25 feet long and maybe six feet wide and is in a raised, uh, it's made out of, of retaining wall block and it's sitting basically in the parking lot and it supports a ton of pollinator life. It's absolutely beautiful and it's a very small area. So I just want to encourage you first that you don't need a, a five acre yard that you're turning to prairie or something like that in order to support pollinator life, to have a micro prairie, things like that. So that's number one. Um, but Number two, I brought this, uh, this leaf and showed it on Facebook the other day and talked about um, the, for whatever reason, I don't, it's been going on longer than, uh, than I guess the uh, social media, Instagram, uh, you know, craze where, you know, every picture has to be airbrushed and touched up and perfect and all that kind of stuff. This, I think, predates that. But for some reason, uh, I'll just say people in general, have it in their head that every plant should look perfect, that every leaf should be green, that there shouldn't be a brown spot or a hole in a leaf or any type of anything that might look look unhealthy. And I just want to maybe set the record straight, dispel some of those myths. Um, if, if your plants aren't being fed on, they're not supporting any life, any, any part of the ecosystem. Um, if, if we're not chewing holes in leaves, things like that, we're not supporting the ecosystem. If the flowers aren't being fed on, you know, of course, pollinators are, are not necessarily harming the plant. Obviously, they're collecting pollen and moving on and, and nectar and things like that. So, um, but this is, this is caterpillar damage on a Joe pie weed. There's four or five uh, different caterpillars that feed on Joe pieweed and it looks exactly like this and guess what it causes no harm whatsoever this is something that has evolved with that the insect doesn't feed so heavily that it damages the plant and it only feeds on the leaf surface itself not on the stems or crown of the plant or anything like that so it's going to cause no damage to the plant I brought up uh, a leaf from our swamp white oak here at Wasco um, and you can see there's kind of a nice uh, oval shaped hole chewed in the leaf surface right there. Um, oaks, I actually brought up an oak here. This also is a swamp white oak. I brought up a small swamp white oak here. Um, oaks support more insect uh, species than any other plant. So there's, uh, I think it's well over 400 different species of insects that that use an oak tree for some form or fashion during its life, uh, during its life cycle. So that could be uh, a caterpillar um, munching on a leaf, which is what I believe this is. This looks to me like caterpillar um, damage. Again, not harmful to the tree whatsoever. So um, in the case of oak trees, like I said, over 400 different species of insects are going to use the oak tree. Um, not too far behind is this one here. This is a shagbark hickory. Uh, the hickory family, which includes pecan and pig nut and bitter nut and um, all of those, um, also support a huge population of insect life. But if we start spraying our hickories, our oaks, our pieweed, all of those things because we're seeing a couple little holes here or there, or even a lot of holes in the foliage, we're going to do a lot more harm than good. So the reason that I bring this up is twofold. One, like I said, just to dispel any myths that, you know, 
if, if it has a hole in its leaf that I have to spray it or uh, that it, it's going to be damaging, things like that. Um, but also because there are uh, certain companies, and I'm not going to bring any of them up, but there are certain companies that come around or send postcards and other literature to your house every year, and they want to sign you up for a fertilization program and or um, an insect control. And that might be insect control on your trees and shrubs, which a lot of companies are out there selling. Um, and, or it may be a, uh, like mosquito application. Not a huge fan of either of those for a couple of reasons. One, um, if you truly wanna do some research on like the mosquito spraying that is done, you know, specifically more on like a small scale in people's yards, there are various companies that just come out and do just that. Um, they are getting just the, the, the amount of chemical that is being applied less than one hundredth of a percent of that chemical is actually landing on a mosquito and harming mosquitoes. The rest of it, so 99.99% is just going into the atmosphere on our plants, on our lawn, on our pets, on our kids, on our beneficial insects. So um, I don't love the mosquito spraying programs. Um, I'd much rather see you just put some uh, uh, some mosquito repellents, uh, either natural or otherwise, on, on your person, um, or just, you know, kind of put, you know, the, the candles, the lemongrass plants, citronella, things like that on, on your uh, patio. You can actually take those leaves and crunch them up and even just rub them on your skin that actually works really well throw a dryer sheet in your pocket you know some of those things will t uh, will keep the um, mosquitoes away um, so that's number one but number two the companies who are out there spraying all of your trees and shrubs you sign up with them at the beginning of the year and they come out three four times a year and spray everything for insects now two things are happening there and the reason that i don't i actually don't like both of these things one they are taking a one size fits all approach to spraying, which is would be the same as 10 people walking into a doctor's office and that doctor writing a, a handful of prescriptions and just handing them out to all 10 people. You can't do that, right? I mean, that just seems absurd when we talk about humans and a doctor, but it's the exact same thing in plant life and in insect uh, control. So. A uh, number of things happen. There are certain things that we don't want to or need to be spraying, like the examples that I showed you. But uh, more importantly, the if it's necessary to spray for some uh, foreign insect or some actually damaging insect, uh, let's say magnolia scale, for instance. Um, a lot of our, our uh, friends and customers around here have magnolias. They're absolutely beautiful trees. We have one at home. I love it. If I had magnolia scale, I would absolutely spray for magnolia scale. It can be a very devastating insect to a magnolia tree. However, there are certain times of the year when magnolia scale is susceptible to being sprayed. If I hire a one-size-fits-all approach type company to spray my lawn or my trees and shrubs, I am going to be sold a false sense of security thinking that my trees and shrubs are taken care of and that the magnolia scale or whatever else I may have going on is being taken care of. And in actuality, it isn't because they're, they're wasting the chemicals and they're spraying at a time of year when it's not necessarily going to uh, affect or help uh, in terms of like magnolia scale, for instance. So um, I'm going to get off my soapbox now, but I just wanted to bring that up in terms of um, the chemical application, all that kind of stuff. There are absolutely things that need to be uh, sprayed and taken care of. Um, I like to do two things. I like to have an informed approach and a targeted approach. So informed means let's figure out what type of plant we have and let's figure out what type of insect is causing that damage. And from there, then we can determine, is that insect going to damage the plant's overall health or is it just an aesthetic thing? Or is the amount of damage being done such that the plant can grow through that and survive just fine without being sprayed? Or is it something that is going to affect the overall health of the plant, 
the longevity of the plant, or in the case of like fruits and vegetables, in its actual production. So that's number one. And then when I say uh, targeted, then we want to figure out what that insect is and then do something that is A, going to take care of it. Uh, I, um, and I certainly don't mean to make fun, but I had a customer in just the other day who has been spraying a, an insect problem with a fungicide for the last three weeks. So it made three applications, 10 days apart roughly, and it's, that obviously is an absolute waste. And uh, so, you know, a lot of chemical put into the environment that isn't necessary. Um, so we want to find out exactly what it is and then use a chemical that specifically targets that type of insect. For instance, there are certain uh, chemicals that will work against mites uh, or aphids that won't work against uh, scale or some other insect. So find the right thing. So informed and targeted. If you ever need help with that, for sure you can come in here bring us plant samples, bring us leaf samples, uh, put it, the insect in a baggie or a pill bottle or whatever, and we'll help you as best we can.